So the way I should have done this was to say, had I done this misspelling in JavaScript, how is that going to go for me? Um, retroactively, uh, we'd probably get a Well, oh, you can't quite see everything. The problem is that uh, there's no such thing as undefined in, uh, in Elm. So our rough equivalent is you can say, well, there's nothing here. And again, we say, hey, autofocus is expecting a Boolean. If you're giving something that could be there or not, you need to handle that explicitly. So it's able to not just check that your functions are correct, but all the arguments to your functions are correct. Uh, Code is a bit so rather than going, we'll start with something much simpler. So um, here's the code that was up before. We can get rid of that. Um, that just says hello. Um, so let's take a look at that. Um, okay, we can see. Hey, hello. Um, so at this point, we're just sort of putting little functions together. So we can say HTML.div, and then put stuff in our div. It still works. I guess it will be in a div. Let's try something fancier. Very slight. And this OK, OK. Um, also, I want to say, if, you, if anyone has any questions, feel free to interrupt and, and ask what's going on. Um, so one thing that might be a little odd here is the, um, the syntax here. You can think of it as, if you're in JavaScript, we're just calling a function um, that has these arguments. Uh, in fact, <laughs> uh, whenever, I whenever I save a tool called Elm format is running, that will put it into a nice format. So that's why the... Uh, parentheses disappeared. It was like, hey, you don't need those. Um, OK, so once we start to deal with these primitives, we can start to break them out into uh, smaller pieces. So maybe I want to um, <laughs> go a more interesting direction. So let's make an interactive programmer, program. So And part of my goal is to make some mistakes so that the compiler can help out. So it program sort of has three key parts. So representation of the application. There's an update function, which des describes how to update that model. And there's a view that says, given the model, put something on screen. So say we want our first little action to button and increment a number. So our model is we want to make that go higher. So our view might take the model and say div. And update is we get some message get our model, and we'll just give back our model for now. So let's see what this looks like. So can't find if maybe you want the following HTML.div. That looks promising. Um, so we can actually say exposing all the stuff. And now those will be in scope without the prefix. So we can say, hey, there's our, our model. Oh. Can't see it. Starter program. Um, so if we want this a bit more interesting, maybe we could add this that says uh, one click increment. Okay. 
and then we can create a message. So in this case, we say case message of we want a model greater by one. So let's see if it works. batteries. Yeah, who's, who's confused and why? Tell me. It's okay to be confused. Yeah, it's, it's no problem. The, the goal here is I, I want you to, to learn stuff. It's, it's, it's good. Huh? I'm not confused yet, but uh, I had a question. Uh, given that you generate all HTML from code, uh, I wonder how designers react to that? Yeah. Um, so a coworker of mine, he says it in a cool way, which is that if uh, like designers are smart and if they can figure out how to read HTML and CSS, they can figure out how to read that. Um, right, like to think that the angle brackets in, like it, it's, it's insane. Um, and this is uh, pretty similar. Um, so I, I think at least in Nova Inc., there's been no trouble. So I, I know our designer has, has one commit, at least, um, from making changes. They want something put in container. What does that mean? Well, say if they want to uh, have something nicely uh, packaged so that they can style it in a different way. Other part of the like a component. Like a the designer is deciding how you structure your code? The designer yeah. does this. I, I this work with some do, but this draft. Because it really depends. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, you write that you probably shouldn't. But <laughs> well, but I mean, if your designer is writing code, then that means they're writing JavaScript now. So it, it, it seems like it's it's uh, it, it's a it's an odd question. I, I'd be curious to learn more details about your scenario. Um, okay. So we've got a basic program here. And let's say we want to add an exciting new feature, which is a decrement button. We're really bending the feature set here to what our clients need. Um, and let's see. Oh, yeah. Oh, let's just check out what, what problems this shows. Um, OK, so on click, it has no idea what that is. Oh man, okay, we started making it more complicated before we made it work. Okay, on click. I'm just going to import a couple other things attributes and events. Okay, so now I have this button and I can press it and we can see it incrementing. Okay. Hey! <laughs> so when you look at what we wrote here, we've got a view, which is quite literal. There's text and there's a button. And we produce these messages that are fed into our update. Um, so uh, another thing we can check out is, OK, so this screen's a little smaller than, OK. So we can explore the history of this program. Well, this history is not very interesting. Um, we, we just can see all the messages that were produced. It turns out they're all increments. But, OK, we need a more interesting program. Um, so let's say we want to add a decrement button. Um, and we need a new kind of message, which is talking about decrementing. And OK, let's go, let's go here. Let's say this is all we wrote. Um, OK, so what's the problem? Uh, can people read this OK, by the way? 
Um, Okay, so the case does not have branches for all possibilities. You need to account for the following values. Decrement. Okay, so we go check out our code. Now, the cool thing about this check is that had you done similar code, perhaps with a switch or with an if, and you forgot, it'd just be like, well, you know, that's going to crash. Um, and... If you misspelled one of the things, let's try misspelling one of the things. <coughs> yeah, oh, maybe you meant decrement. Yes. Okay, so now I have my two buttons. I need to distinguish them. <coughs> Can you tell by the visuals that I write compilers and, and, and not web apps? Um, so now we can increment and decrement. So now our history is a little bit more interesting. We can see all these messages still and see how it's changed. So uh, the reason I keep showing this, uh, this playground is uh, that's just a built-in debugger for Elm. So it actually shows up with any program we use. So if I go back to our to do MVC and say debug, oh, I, I, I forgot. I made an error. So we can get that same debugger in this program. And so if I reset this, let's say clear. OK, invent the universe, bake an apple pie, and then say I, that's done, <coughs> pie needs to happen. And then I'm like, wait, let's look at these different views. OK, I don't know. So then we can go look at our history. Uh, and let's expand these so we can see as they go. Um, I can go back and just see what's happened throughout the whole history of the program. Um, and so you can see on this side, as we press enter, we see things showing up. And then they get selected and deselected as we move around. So if we go to the latest version, I'll expand these. Um, and then I mess with this, we can say, um, eat the pie. You can see it all updating over here. Um, and then I can say, uh, let's mess with this one. Uh, I want this to be true. Um, and then I say, OK, no, I need to be more specific, which pie. Um, so you can see everything that's sort of going on. And at this point, we kind of have an idea of how this program is implemented, because that's our application state. And the neat thing here is that this isn't if you write your program in exactly the right way, then you'll get this. It's this Elm is designed such that this is available to you. Um, and I guess the extra neat thing is that we can export this program. And if I open up Opera, uh, also though this is, did, do you know that's, the, that's Herman Rorschach? He made the Rorschach test, but doesn't it look like Brad Pitt? <laughs> it did, it did, okay. Anyway, OK, so here's one of the examples of uh, 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 one of the things done with WebGL. Um, did he share the code? Come on. I think we should just go to his GitHub. But the point is, uh, there's actually a ton of, um, oh. Uh, so it's just the primitive stuff. So yeah, here's another one. This is a WebGL game where he's doing 2D animation to make things a bit more efficient. Um, so yeah, so it's giving you access to shaders and access to sort of the raw primitives so you can do reflections and that kind of stuff. Um, there's not a big physics library written, but you know, you can, you can write such things. It's possible. Um, so uh, I, I want there to be, there's one more that's really cool, but I, we may not be able to find it. Anyway. Okay, yeah. Could you 
So one of the things that uh, is great when you're using Elm is that it has no runtime errors. And so if we put JavaScript in it, we, we would. Um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I don't mean to say it in a jokey way. It's, um, so OK, let's give up on that. Um, so we have a, a way of communicating with JavaScript called ports. Um, so if we check out, I don't know. This isn't exactly the diagram you want. But the idea is that you have an Elm chunk that's within that code. We're not going to have any errors. And then we're able to send messages out to JavaScript. Anything can happen. And then JavaScript can send message, messages back to us. Uh, kind of. It's not the same as in a lot of languages where you say, hey, here's the name of the function I'm going to call. It's sort of more like a client-server relationship. So I think of it as like JavaScript as a service. You say, here's some stuff. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if it's going to succeed or fail. Tell me if you have any interesting results. Um, and so we think that's a good way of keeping Elm nice and giving you the ability to talk to JavaScript as needed. Um, but yeah, so if we look at the um, to do MVC thing that we saw before, um, it actually uses uh, port. Those are called ports. Those the where the messages are sent in and out of Elm, um, and so we can say we create a full screen Elm application, and then we take some of the ports of it. One called set storage. We subscribe to all the messages coming out, and we set local storage when that happens. So it's quite easy to do, and you can imagine having a much more complex chunk of JavaScript here. But so one, so imagine a world where we could bring JavaScript in directly. Um, that would probably mean we had we would have jQuery in Elm, and you know I, I think that would have been a mistake. So 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 I'm I'm happy with the the trade off here, but it is a bit odd. Yeah. So we, we tried to bring in, um, okay, the, yeah. So we tried to bring D3 in. There were projects along these lines. And it actually has quite a bizarre, well, so, so Elm has, a, has types, right? So part of why we can give these nice error messages is because we know hey, that needs to be an integer that's flowing through there, or it needs to be a record with these particular fields. Um, and putting types on D3 is, uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't recommend giving it a shot. Um, and so rather than going that route, we've been trying to grow visualization libraries in Elm. So when we saw the Elm plot library, this is just an Elm library that's it's pure Elm, and it's going from data to SVG. Um, and so the idea is that we're going to get a solution that fits a lot better in Elm if we grow it ourselves. And that definitely takes longer, but the goal for me isn't I want to have a language that's all right today. Like, I, I, I want it to be really good. And so um, that's a trade-off that, you know, you can always go out through ports if you need something urgently that's not supported. But not everyone wants it to be that way. And they say, I want access, and I don't care how many times my application crashes in my customer's hands. <laughs> uh, so another thing I'm working on, like, quite recently is um, doing some animation. Uh, I, 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 I can try to bring it up, but oh, now I have two local hosts running. Oh, but it worked. Weird. So we can make this a bit smaller. And so you can start to do some animations. And so What's interesting in Elm is because you uh, will end up with a library that can do animation and a library that can do visualization, and then they can be mixed and matched in any way. So it's not like you're bought into a massive library that does every possible visualization conceivable. It's you can learn how to animate, and then you can pick and choose, do I want that person's heat maps or this particular style of plots? And So I think end up with something quite cool. But 
We can't just be like, oh, we have D3. Yeah. You happen, to, you happen to compile to JavaScript for the sake of running a web browser. Do you want to talk a little bit about like, that process? And... Yeah. So for folks who who don't, I don't know, are there folks who are like un, uncomfortable with having a compiler in between them and running stuff in the browser? Is any hands? It's okay. Okay. I guess by, by this year, so many people have some sort of translation happening between their JavaScript and their other JavaScript, um, that it's not so weird. But yeah, so we have uh, a compiler that's generating reasonably sized JavaScript, and it's, it's quite fast as well. Um, and so I'm currently doing some work to make the JavaScript smaller and the compiler faster. Um, but yeah, so uh, I guess what you're getting at is uh, it's not innately, the language Elm is not innately tied to JavaScript. Um, and so that's another reason why we don't have just a typical foreign function interface is as soon as we have libraries in the ecosystem that are, oh, this is just JavaScript co code, we lose the ability to target other platforms. So let's say uh, WebAssembly comes along and that's a good trade-off for certain problems. Elm can very easily change its runtime to target that and the whole ecosystem just works there and is very fast. Um, so that that's another piece of this uh, uh, design consideration. Do you want to use uh, on this computer, there is. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's something we're working on. The 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 biggest uh, uh, questions we'll get these days are about: um, Can I do efficient bundling of assets? Can I do server side rendering? Essentially, how can I get my page loads very very fast? Um, and so, yeah, I've been working on that for quite a while now, and I'm, I'm hoping to get something out, you know, t t traveling around, it's a, a speed bump in the, in the process, but, um, but yeah, so, uh, I don't 100% want to talk about it on video, because I, I kind of, uh, I find it lame when someone's like, hey, there's this thing that it doesn't exist yet. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're working on server-side rendering along with some other compiler things to make code smaller. Ah, okay. <laughs> so uh, one of the uh, optimizations I did recently is dead code elimination, which JavaScript people call tree shaking for some reason. I don't know. Because um, it's like if you shake a tree, like good things might fall off the tree. Like I find it a very weird analogy. <laughs> And like, yeah, anyway, um, so that we're seeing quite good size decreases. So if we checked out the, if we minified and gzipped the to-do MVC application that we saw, that's about 25 kilobytes. Um, and that's including the Elm runtime, immutable lists, our virtual DOM implementation. And that's without the new dead code elimination stuff. So with that, it's, I'll just say like half-ish because I don't want to give particular numbers because it's still subject to change a little depending on some other choices. But So we're getting quite small, um, and that's not including uh, asset bundling, right? So you could also imagine take the core libraries and the virtual DOM library and say that's separate, and all that's left is this uh, other, other layer of application code. And if you do that, you're now talking about I, so, 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 so imagine that the size of to do MVC was 12 kilobytes. Um, now you're talking about like a one chunk that's five, one chunk that's seven. Um, and that one chunk that's five is now shared between all your pages everywhere. Um, so you're getting down to quite small size. I shouldn't be. <sighs> shh, shh, okay, it's, it, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, okay, so if Elm were to run on servers, you then have to ask the question, should it run on Node? Uh, and I think the answer is no. 
Um, right, so Elm has a bunch of design pieces. It's so it can run a bunch faster than Node ever conceivably could. For example, because we have immutability, it's actually very easy to make very concurrent programs without crazy bugs. Um, so it's very hard to like spin up new OS level threads in Node, but we not only need that ability, but it'd be cool if we could have schedulers within there that's doing thousands of little concurrent processes as well. So I think Node would be a bad choice. Uh, all, this, all this is to say I've thought about it a lot, and it's a it's a very difficult problem. So so another way to say this is uh, um, I've been working on Elm about six years, and it's like pretty good. And I suspect that if you choose any domain, it's going to be about five to ten years before it's any good. Um, so I, I think even if we just said, forget improving Elm in the browser, it's all about servers, it'd be quite a while. And for me, you know, I, I work on this for my whole life, basically. Um, and if I was going to target servers, I'd want it to be the best. And if it was going to be like, all right, I, that'd be pretty lame. I don't know. So, so it's something I think about a lot, but I, I wouldn't say it's near term. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, you can use whatever backend you want. If if you're into running Haskell, that's great. Yeah, um, and I know some folks have done tricks where they try to share some data structures between these languages. There's cool stuff you can do there, but my goal is I want Elm to be to not care what's going on on your back end, just because if I'm dictating, things will be nice if you use this and things will be bad if you use that. It's not going to work for very many people. So. Um, there's not a, a big project along these lines doing the, I, I don't know the exact details of how they're making it more incremental. Um, it's, there's no real limitation in Elm, but it's not a big focus, right? So when, when I, when I think about what are the big problems for Elm users, it's not performance. We're, we're, we're doing well there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are some tricks we could do. I mean, just just thinking of it in that way, you could say, well, if I get to a point where I'll just uh, quit and use this sort of intermediate form of the virtual DOM, and then I'll do a diff again later. But yeah, th th that's not a big emphasis right now. It, it doing. Uh huh. For creating real real world application, you soon need something like forms, validation of forms. Uh huh. Something like is, is there already something in, in the ecosystem? Um. So. Routing. Yeah. So uh, when it comes to like figuring out what's going on in your URL bar, um, we have a URL parser. We have a thing for managing navigation. Um. For form validation, it's actually uh, very straightforward to do it yourself. I'm sure there are libraries as well, but we can mess with that. So we were looking at this with CSS thing, and let's change it to um, other password and add a couple a couple things. We should just call it password. 
and then Okay, so now we have these extra things going on, and instead of this, we can say verify password. Um, and then where do we have to add it? Okay, on input. And then on input. Other password. Okay, does it work? I've lost it now. Okay. So let's open this up so we can see what's going on. Classic password. Okay, so um, what we can now do, so th th I've been, I was changing these things a bit. Okay, so we can change this to password. Um, So what we can do now is we know what the two things they've typed in it are. So we can say if model dot password does not equals model dot other password, then we're fine. We don't have to show anything. Else we should oops. say, how do they do it here? Inline this. So we can say, blah. All right, did I do all right? I did not. If text equals password. Okay, so now when I say hello, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So it's relatively straightforward to check and you can even just do it by hand in this way, but I'm, I, I don't know offhand what the libraries are that are super popular for doing this. But I suspect because it's so straightforward, people often don't reach for libraries for this kind of thing. Did it make sense what, what happened with the code change there? Did, wait, did it not make sense what happened with the code change there? Okay, okay. I think because I, I got all this CSS in the way, right? But if I make it like optimally ugly, people are like, man, Elm's ugly. If I make it, it's like, ah. HTML is likely. Um, but okay, so I, I guess one piece that, of what was going on here is we added messages for each of the different kinds of inputs we can deal with. Um, and in each case, we're updating our model depending on the new stuff. Does that part make sense? Um, and then here we added put handlers for each of the input fields. Um, so whenever we type in there, we're going to get our message here and update our model. Um, and then in our view, we have access to the whatever is going on in our whole application. So we can say, hey, if it matches, if the two passwords match, then show a particular message or not. Does that make more sense? Oh, this. Okay. Um, so whenever you see, this is called a pipe uh, in Elm, and it essentially means that all the rest of this stuff is in parentheses. 
Um, so we could have said it that way as well. It'd probably be better to say let is good password. Or no. And then move this over there. Yeah, it, this is this is probably a better way to go. And then it seems to work. Yeah. So that operator is actually quite common in Elm, so it might be cool to play with it a bit. Um, so if I were to say, let's go back to a much simpler program. So so rather than having all this stuff going on, we'll just say HTML or sorry, text hello, but we could do something like list.reverse one, two, three. And then we could say text to string and show that on screen, I assume. Hold on, I think I have too many servers running or something. Yeah. Okay, so now I can check out my playground and I can see three, two, one. Now, man, these things are piling up. Okay, so if we look at this code, um, we saw that that operator that was pipe in that direction and it just means pretend all the parentheses are, are used. So we can use it here and say, we don't need those parentheses and we can say it here, and we can say we don't need those parentheses, and it means the same thing. But the cooler version of this is we can actually do it in the other direction. And that means the same thing as well. And that gives you a more like to write style that you might see if you're chaining operators in JavaScript. So we can say reverse this list, and then say list map and we can take all the numbers and square them I guess I don't know we can do whatever we want with them um, and let's see so we can just keep chaining these things along that's lame uh, yeah well yeah whatever we want to do Um, and so this is actually quite a common style that you'll see in Elm code where people will chain a bunch of functions in this way. Um, so, so yeah, this is quite a common idiom. Perhaps weirdly, um, the languages I tend to use to write the compiler don't have this operator. So I don't use it, but everyone in the Elm community does. So I, I write weird code uh, as a result. Uh-huh. It's written in Haskell. Okay. Yeah. So, wait, this operator, does it change operator precedence? And that's how it works? Because uh, Haskell is something similar like that, right? Kind of. I mean, the, compiler's, the, the, the compiler could be written in anything, and it'd have no impact on what's happening here, right? So. No, no, I get that. But I mean, this operator in particular is easy to derive. Because like, in Haskell, if you have a, you're trying to compose a bunch of functions, right? Sometimes you want to trigger the operator precedence it's a dollar sign. Yeah, that's the one. So, yeah, then you would change the. Yeah, so we do have a. Same idea that's being yeah, so we have an idea of how things get grouped. But I, I, I think for the purpose of this, it's like it's clear to just look at it and be like, oh, like I reverse it, then I do a map, then I do a reverse, make it. Like it just reads properly, and the precedence is set up behind the scenes to do the right thing. Mm hmm? Uh, like 
if you were to write an actual full Ellen program like this, you'd end up with one file that has 10,000 lines. Uh, so, so I guess the question is, can you, can you decompose the programs with the whole loop and view and model and everything and like combine them and build bigger programs like that? Yeah, so um, I just gave a talk at Elm Europe that was all about this because JavaScript sort of pushes you in a particular direction, which is you write a component, you fill up these little components, and, and that model's all right, but you run into issues like um, let's say you ha you're making a custom dropdown for your application, and you have, say, three of them, and each of them is a component and they model whether or not they're open or closed. But what that means is they can all be open at the same time, which isn't how dropdown should work on a page. So it sort of preemptively pushes state down to lower levels that it might make sense. And so in Elm, you'd end up with a way of saying, what's the dropdown that's selected? And so it, here's, here's another way to say it. Um, in Elm, we prefer to structure modules around data structures. Um, so if you find that oh, I'm writing a lot of code that's about items in my to-do list, I'll break out a module that's about items and has a bunch of helper functions related to that. So it's less about here's a component that maps onto a visual thing on screen and more about here are data structures and helper functions that I can then use in these other contexts. So, okay, to be, to be more concrete, um, let's see, um, okay, so this example I think is relevant. So if we were in the React reality, these would probably each be components and the thing around them would be a component. And so here what we're doing is our model stays one flat thing. Um, and our update works very similarly to what we saw already with the um, text fields. Um, and the thing is we just make a helper function in our view code, right? So when we want to show a text box, we say, what's the message that it'll produce? And what's the string that I want to add in there? And then we just have a simple function for displaying it. So rather than, yeah, so we essentially decompose views into helper functions. Updates get decomposed into helper functions there. So it's also decoupled in a way that doesn't cleanly have a corresponding. But yeah, but you still, you still decouple. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, 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 interesting thing, though, is um, so one of the problems with very long files in JavaScript is let's say you have an object that's passed around and ends up being known by a bunch of different code. Um, there's a very high chance that this code will mutate it. And this code will then get weird results uh, 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 because, because that happened. And so because we don't have mutation, there aren't these sort of spooky interactions at a distance. So file length is a less, it's less predictive of uh, potential bugs. So the, we saw the to-do MVC was 400 lines. In Elm, that's, like, that's not a bad thing. It's just, it's just fine. Um, Uh, it's not inconceivable, um, and there are ways to break that up as well. Um, so one thing you could do is say, uh, here's a message that has string data, here's a message that has uh, some other kind of data, here's a message that has another set of messages. And so you could sort of decompose it and say, I don't know how well this works uh, as a verbal explanation, <laughs> um, but you could essentially make two different types of messages where the overall one can refer to the secondary one. Um, and so then you can decompose in that way as well. So but Yeah, exactly. Um, but, but rather than going that route f at first, right? So like that's a, that's a thing that you'd want to do once you have a really big application. And yeah, so, so a thing that's important to think about in Elm is th there's a lot of desire for sort of preemptive uh, refactoring, um, and in Elm, it's a it's a good idea to just wait and see what ends up happening, and you'll be able to see the lines that your your particular application has 
uh, rather than sort of preemptively trying to cut everything up and then if you get the lines wrong. Um, the other detail is that um, refactoring is quite cheap in Elm, right? So if you had, let's say, 10,000 lines of JavaScript in one file and you wanted to make a change, you probably would just not. Right? <laughs> um, but the way Elm's compiler works, it's actually very good at doing those kinds of refactors. So even if it's spread out over 20 files, if I rename something over here, it's going to go and find all the uses in my whole code base and tell me about them and make me fix them. And if I change how that function is called, so maybe it has an extra optional parameter now, um, everyone in the whole code base is going to have to deal with that as well. Um, so that sort of changes how you will develop a big code base. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, so um, right now we have plugins for most of the editors that people would be using. Um, I happen to use Sublime, but Atom is very popular for Elm as well, um, and VS Code is, is popular as well. And each of them have sort of different levels of stuff depending on the editor author, uh, the plugin author. So there's some where uh, if you write down a type annotation, it'll start filling in some code for you. Um, I think uh, uh, most of them have jump to definition kind of stuff. Um, and then outside of that, um, Richard, who did the big SPA example I was showing, um, he works on Elm test. Let's see if he has a good demo on the, on his page. It doesn't show the output, but essentially, um, doing unit tests is, uh, pretty nice, so we can make simple unit tests, um, but we can also do what we call fuzz testing, so it essentially generates random inputs and sees if, uh, if they work out. Um, so this one's saying, if we reverse a string twice, uh, it should be equal to the beginning one, and it's just generating random strings. Um, so that's a nice way of sort of uh, finding bugs that you maybe wouldn't have thought of on your own. And it focuses on testing the corner cases in combination. So if you get an int and a string and a list, it'll emphasize lo very small numbers, zero, and very large numbers, things that would tend to mess stuff up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, we ended up calling it fuzz testing because that's sort of a more generic, helpful name than quick check, because it actually, these tests can be quite slow. Um, right, well, not the whole testing, but if you're generating 100 cases, you have to test all 100 cases. So you can essentially turn the dial and say, I want to test 10,000 things. It's going to take long. So yeah, it's a, it's quick check's an odd name, given that. Yeah. yeah. Why does it take long? Say again? Oh, just because if you generate, if you generate ten thousand things to test, you have to you have to run them. Okay. If you generate two, then it will not take long at all. Yeah, <laughs> right. So like a unit test is only going to be one, so it's going to be very fast. But I think default to a hundred, um, and so it takes longer. I don't know. I was just joking about the name. It's it's not like these things are like, oh man, like Elm tests are uniquely slow, different than any other tests in any other language. Um, okay, so one of the, yeah, so I think at this point we can try to do some fancier stuff with Elm. Would that be interesting to folks? Uh, okay, so fo fo folks who are totally new um, with the code you've seen so far, ha has that been making sense? Sure. And then, uh, no, sorry, the other one didn't just on that. Okay. And then take off line 12. And then take off line 12. Uh, um. 
I'm just gonna I'm just gonna compile it here. Uh, playground. So if folks can see, yeah. So when mixed with the pipeline operators, the error messages get a little bit crazier. So let's d pipeline. Um, So yeah, so it's saying, oops, function text is expecting a string, but instead it got a list of numbers. Um, yeah. So does, and this gets compiled to JavaScript? Yeah. And then you include that JavaScript on your page? When you're yeah. So behind about, yeah, so uh, one thing that's, let's see. Um, but we had an error, we have to fix the error. So it's a bit, there are pieces where you'll, you'll see exactly what's going on. Um, so wait, is this, okay. Yeah. So we want main. Yeah. So I did this our list data structure is expanded out um, and it makes things a bit harder to read but you can think of this as one two three um, and then you can kind of see the pieces here so we're calling text we're calling two string we're calling reverse we're calling map with everything to the power two we're reversing this list um, and so I think the subtext here is is the generated JavaScript easy to read is that the subject? Um, I was just curious. So, I've never looked at L before. So, yeah, so, yeah. This is doing the hard part of JavaScript for me, basically. Yeah, you, you won't have to touch this stuff. And this is, this is why we can guarantee there's no runtime. This is because we're generating big JavaScript. You don't have uh, control over that. And so there are some kind of neat things going on here. So, for example, you see these variable names are kind of crazy, right? Um, so rather than using, with a lot of, um, in NPM, the packages will be set up as you have this closure, and inside of it you write a bunch of code, and then you say you return the information that you want. Um, and that's actually very hard to minify because you don't know if it gives back 10 things and you only use one of them, it can drop those nine and optimize these out. So what we do instead is we fully prefix every single variable that's used um, with the of the package, the name of the package, the name of the module, and the name of the variable. Uh, and then we just put them all in one big line. And so what that means is when you uglify it, these all go down to one character. And if it's something's not used, then it just get, it just falls out. And so that's something that's very, very difficult to do um, if you're just taking raw NPM packages and trying to make them small. If you what? Oh. Give it create a, a JavaScript <coughs> bindings as well, bindings. Like because some of the core stuff in L, it used JavaScript as well. Like yeah, it's, it's doable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other versions of JavaScript, or just like 
guess it's ES5 or ES3? Three. Um, so my goal is to use as few features as possible, just so it's non-controversial and can run anywhere. Um, we could use newer stuff, but generally we just don't need to. Um, so if we were, like, rather than saying function, we could say another thing. But the only one who has to care is me, and I'm, I'm okay writing the old way. So yeah, that's another piece is um, one of the questions we'll sometimes get is, uh, how are the source maps? Um, but what's interesting is that's, not, that's no person who's been using Elm for, let's say, two or three weeks ever asked that question. Um, there's this expectation that we'll need to be in the stepping through debugger, um, and it turns out that just doesn't happen often. So Elm people are good. So you won't find yourself reading this code. Um, and yeah, like the dollar signs make things a little bit weird. It doesn't fully select, but whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the sort of syntax of Elm, uh -huh. is that like typical of functional languages? Like I've not really had any experience with, with any others other than Elm. Yeah. yeah. Is that kind of typical or? So um, Elm comes from a family of languages called the ML family, and this goes back to the 1970s. And that syntax, the syntax of everything from that lineage is quite similar. Um, so if you go to Haskell, this code would compile. Um, if you go to OCaml, you'd have to say match with. And I think you'd have to put bars here. And that code would compile. So they're all quite, they're all quite similar. Um, one thing we haven't done so far is write down some types um, so we can try that and see how that goes. I don't know if that's a good idea. Um, so here we're saying, I get a message, I get a model, and I produce a model. Um, and this signature is a bit weird because you see the two rows. For someone who's totally new, the way to read it is, it's similar to this. You can just say they're all arguments for the last one. Um, so if you're writing sort of more professional looking Elm, you'll be adding these annotations all the time. So this one is take the model and I give out some HTML that can produce messages. Um, but yeah, and again, this style is very common across uh, any, any language from this family. Uh-huh. Yeah, you could do something like this. I mean, uh, uh, it'd be. Oh. I'm kind of curious is like, can you have multiple update functions that deal with different types of messages, different enumerated groups, so then you can split up your application that way? Or does there only, there can only be one update function? Um, so it just, it's whatever you write right here, right? So this is just a function that exists. It's nothing special or built into the language. We just happen to call it update. We call it uh, Steve goes to the mall. I don't know if you have malls here. But oh, I miss, wait, what did I do? Oh, we didn't create a model type. So yeah, and everything works fine. In a sense, it's not fine. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we could, when you're actually doing sort of larger applications, the refactors you want to emphasize are typically not, let's do update more times. It's how do I write this piece of code in a better way? So um, I think I have an example for you. Um, oh, wait. No, okay, no, I don't, ha I don't have it anymore. Um, but let's say you, um, 
let's look at the do to do MVC stuff and see if there's something there. So this is an update function that's got quite a lot more stuff going on, quite a lot more, but like 10 things going on. Um, and within that code, there's logic of stuff going on. And so one way to look at this is to say, oh, well, I want to break it out into subcomponents. But another way to do it is to just make helper functions within each of these. So I could probably break out this code into its own function and clean this up a bunch. Um, here too, I could probably break this out. I could probably break out some of this logic. And so it's actually better to emphasize how do I act on particular data structures as opposed to how do I decompose update specifically like it's a special kind of function. Does that make sense? So this plotting library is a really good example of like a well-designed Elm library. Um, and so it's really just a view function, right? So you can have the data in whatever format you please. So let's say it's a list of records where it's a person's name, it's their location on a map, and like their health. And we just want to show their location. So the view function essentially says, take that data structure and extract out the 2D point, and this is, it's going to be shown on screen as a, you know, slightly pink dot. Um, and then that's how it will happen. And if you want to put event handlers on that, you can specify it there. So essentially, this library imposes no data structure constraints on you, no update constraints on you. It's just like, I'm going to show pictures, um, and if you want to hear an event when you hover on something, I can give you one. Um, and then it's up to you just like normal. Yeah, and so when I say it's, when you say the, the library is generating it, what's really happening is you have specified. Oh, okay, so you say this is the message I would like to receive. Yeah, and you're saying like on hover, okay. this is the message. So you are actually writing that code. It's not oh. built into the library. Yeah, because this is really just a SVG element, right? And so we can add attributes to it and handlers to it. So totally independent of the library. Uh -huh. Yeah, so on that, I, I was working on a, uh, a map, a tiled map for your Nell. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's similar to this as a view, and it will draw the map. There's a bunch of events it wants to handle itself. It will drag. Uh -huh. How do I avoid having to pass those up to the, essentially, to the outer layer I want to have from that? Uh, uh, that, I, I need more information to to give you a good answer, but we can talk about it later. Okay, yeah. uh -huh. uh, I'm confused about the, the return value of the view function is the HTML message. Is that a type that's generic over message? Or is that not a function, right? Right. So uh, if we check out, let's go Elm REPL and say import HTML exposing everything. So if I say text, it's a function that gives out HTML with a lower message. So that's saying anything can be returned. Um, so if I... So, so is that, does that mean the return value of text is a function? Uh, well, so okay, so if I say, let's say I say this, I get back a list of A, right. so a list of anything. Um, and if I say, um, list of 2.13, oops, you get back a list of float. So sort of fill that hole in with whatever happens to be going on. So in the case of uh, HTML, if we say on click, hello, uh, in the next release, this won't show up. It shouldn't be here. Don't, don't look at the man behind the curtain. Um, but we get an HTML attribute that produces strings. And if we were to say a div with on click, yeah, again, pretend it's not there, but we get HTML that produces a string. Does that make sense? Well, so, so it's a type that's generic over something, right? 
Yeah, so it, it will specify whatever the event's coming out. And so what that means is if you have 10 different uh, event handlers in there and they're producing different kinds of stuff, that'll actually be an error as opposed to things don't get handled in your update. Uh-huh. Uh, so whenever the model changes, we'll update the view. So um, that might sound weird because it's like, oh, will that be slow, right? Is that the question, kind of? Um, so yeah, so for example, when each of these things gets hovered, the model is changing to have that information in there. Um, and so the way we're able to make this fast is we have this operator called lazy. So if we go check out our to do MVC code, um, you'll notice that I have lazy here. So we can get rid of this um, and everything will still work. So view input takes a string and gives us back some HTML. But if we add lazy, essentially what it's saying is I'm going to, rather than creating all this virtual DOM structure. I'm just going to remember that's the function you're giving me and that's the string you're giving me. And when I go do my diff, I'm going to say, is it the same function and the same string as last time? And if so, we not only won't build it, we won't diff it, we won't do any of that work at all. So if you put a couple of these at the root of your application and sort of strategically place these, um, you end up doing quite a minimal rebuild for any given change, right? So if you're doing something very complicated, uh, in some corner, it's likely that the rebuild will be like. Um, so yeah, does that make sense? Um, and that's that's why uh, Elm can be quite fast. So um, I, have, I have some I did benchmark a while ago, but I feel like it, it's a little old, so I, I don't want to uh, uh, present it. But we did we did well then. Um, I think we still do well, but. I wouldn't want to say, oh, if I don't know exactly what React done or Angular has done in the last like three months or whatever. So, is it, so, it, so if you, you do have to have a state update, does it do in the virtual DOM or does it just need the DOM tree and then rebuild it? Say it again? If you actually, like, if, you're lazy, if you actually need to make an update in the DOM, does it actually do, then do something like the virtual DOM? React or does it just new DOM uh, it does it does virtual DOM stuff. So it'll find the minimal change and so yeah. So we yeah, the, a, a big part of the um, the Elm runtime is these kinds of optimizations, uh, of figuring out how to do that. Yeah, it's, uh, I was surprised when I learned that if you use functional components in React, they actually don't uh, memoize for you. Which I assume they did because I was like, oh, that's the reason you have it, right? Because then if you have the same input, you have to run them at all. But yeah, well, and we we actually, like, we one way of saying that is, like, why don't we do lazy fault on all these things, right? We know it's immutable. We know it's fine. But um, not every, you don't necessarily want in every scenario, right? So you may know that if this data changes, I know that a bunch of stuff is going to change. And if you are making lazy checks at all those places, it actually be less efficient. So it's important to sort of be strategic and do some benchmarking on these kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. So then as you say it takes all the time to check everything. Yeah, so uh, it, it would just be the minimal path to your data. Um, so, I mean, given a like insanely complicated thing, maybe it's like 10 levels of DOM or 20 levels of DOM. It's not actually a huge number. Um, mm -hmm. Um, it was kind of a historical accident. I was uh, in university. I learned 
uh, Standard ML and then OCaml, which are languages in the same family. And sort of for fun was learning Haskell and happened to write a parser and happened to write a couple other things. And, and then I was like, hey, I'm having this problem vertically and horizontally centering things. And these things kind of came together in a surprising way. Um, but yeah, the, the, there's no particular, yeah. Yeah, so when you look at this whole family of languages, uh -huh. essentially you can take all the languages and take their intersection of features, and that's what Elm has, right? So anything like fancy or Haskell, or, we don't we don't have. Uh, is pretty similar. So so if you learn Elm, it'll be relatively easy to go check out OCaml or Haskell. Haskell will be trickier, but you know, yeah, it translates well. Okay, so I, uh, we can we can try some more code stuff. Also, um, we can take a break and then come back and do some more stuff. Does that is that something that people are interested in? Okay, yeah. So let's take a break, like five minutes, and then we'll come back.
Uh, how, how, oh, one sec, one sec. Yeah, one, one sec, one sec. Okay, so the, the question was, how many folks here know what tail call, or have heard of tail call optimization? Okay, how many people know how to do tail call optimization in Elm? Okay, okay, let's do that and then and we'll call it and then we can we can talk and stuff afterwards. So All right, we're going to Okay, so <laughs> Typically, um when you're writing Elm programs, you don't need to write recursive functions, but it can happen. It might come up. So the uh, let's write a few and see how it goes. Um, so I can say length. Let's call it uh, my length function it takes a list. And so I can say case list of and the list is either an empty list, in which case the length is zero, or um, it's a the front and the back. So, okay. Say again? Yes. Good thinking. So, okay. So, I, uh, I, I, I took too many steps here. So, I can say two string one, two, three. And then compile that. And then I didn't finish this function. So, let's say debug.crash. So you can you can have runtime errors, but you have to explicitly tell uh, tell the program like I would like the whole program to crash right now, please. Um, so let's forget about this part. We just want to look at this one, two, three. Um, so another way can we can write this is um, so the way lists are built up is actually all right. We're going to use types again. we can say, here's our empty list, and if we want to put a three on it, we can say, we'll put three on the front. Um, ah, okay, no, okay. Here's a better way to do this. Rewind, rewind, rewind. Um, <laughs> let's find a list in Elm. So it can either be empty, or it can be a list with let's say an integer and uh, more list. Uh, and so when we start building up structures with this, we can say, um, okay, a list can be empty or I can have a non-empty list with a 42 and then I need to give it another list. Well, what is a list? Well, it can be empty or it can be a non-empty list. So I can say, here's a non-empty list with 41, and then we'll say it's empty. So this can be our representation of a list data structure. So we always have something that's got a thing and more list, or it's empty. Um, and so when we look at the actual implementation of Eh, let's let's stick with this. So for for some historical reasons, this is called cons. Usually, usually, you have to ask the list people why they chose to do this. But that's that's how things went. Um, and so when we check the length of the list, we can say, well, a list is either empty, or it's a cons with some front and the back of the list. So at this point. The question is, how do we figure out the rest of this? And so one crucial trick when writing recursive functions is to pretend you're already done. Okay, so pretend we have a function called my length that gets the length of a list. Someone who has never coded Elm before, can you give me a, <coughs> I apologize. Uh, um, can you give me a guess of what uh, should get filled in here?
Okay, so let's give this a try. So we can say... And then we get two. Um, and if we write out more of this, which like... This isn't the most lovely syntax, then we get three. Um, and so what's happening here is you can think of it as just expanding out. So you can think of this being a find and replace where there's just another um, another one of these whenever you do the recursion. And this would just keep going forever and ever and ever until we get to an empty and then it all rolls back and adds up. So this is kind of the danger with recursion is we'll make a function call and we'll make a function call and we'll make a function call. And the way this works in your machine is you have a stack of memory, and so a function call takes up some space. It calls a function, it calls a function, it calls a function, it calls a function. So if we have an extraordinarily long list, this could be a problem. So I guess we can, if we, we need to switch away from um, our custom list implementation. So my length. Um, so in Elm, the way the built-in version of these things uh, look a bit different. So the empty list looks like this, and this cons idea looks like this. I'm thinking about changing it so it doesn't look like this because this is kind of weird. Um, and so then here, you when you're pattern matching, it looks the same. So we've now rewritten, and it should work. Oh, yeah. And so we get three. So this rewritten version, we can now say list uh, range from 0 to 10,000. And I think this should give us problems. Wait, did it give us problems? OK, cool. OK, so it was printing out the stack that was too long. And it turns out we call the same function a bunch of times to go all the way through. Um, OK, so the way we deal with this is called tail call optimization. So rather than building up this stack of function call, function fall, um, and on each of those frames, we have a, well, I need to add one. So this one says, I'm going to add one to whatever the result is. I'm going to add one, I'm going to add one. And they have to remember all those ones all the way. So the trick we can do is essentially to keep a running total. Um, so rather than just writing this in the typical way, we can say, let's make a helper function that has the total and the list. So when we get to the end, we give back the total. And when we are at the front, we say, my length help total plus one. And then we explore the back of the list. Um, and so my length help zero list. So this is kind of a, a little shuffle. So rather than, I should have kept the old version. What, what was I thinking? Um, one plus. And this one will call my length tail call optimized. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 Okay. Oh, and then, yeah, we used a very long list again. Um, so for the sake of things running, we'll do this for a second. Um, OK, so in this new version, which it's kind of hard to see them both now, I'm going to make them a little smaller. Um, in this one, we had to do the function call and then come back to do more work. Now, in this case, each of the branches either ends with a result or ends with a function call. So there's no information that we have to come back to. right? So when we say, here's the function call, it calls a function, it calls a function, it calls a function. But when they return, 
there's no more computation to do. So what we can do instead is we say, here's a function, it calls a function, but we don't need to come back here, so we just put it in that place. And so we keep just using the same frame over and over and over again so that we don't use up any memory. Um, and so if we switch this to my length tail TCO, no, I'll write out the full name. Okay, so that one still works, but that one does too. I think that one just takes a long time, we'll see. Yeah, I think it just takes a long time. <laughs> so okay, so that's kind of the, the basic trick of tail call optimization. Wow, I think I made a poor choice. <laughs> um, There's no way out of this. Wait, will it have the code in it? Did I? Okay, yeah, no, let's bail, let's bail. Yeah. So, yeah, pick smaller numbers, I guess, I don't know. I guess it was a... Uh, 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 a lot of memory to allocate, I'm not sure. Um, okay, so that's kind of the basic trick of doing a doing tail call optimization, is whenever you see a result that has a function call and then needs to come back, you can, the information that you wanna end up returning, you move it to an argument and you pass it along. Um, so I wanna look at the code that got generated here. Um, so tail call optimized, oops. Okay, yeah, so here's the code that we ended up with when we did our helper function. So we have a function that takes total and list, and then it's a while loop that if our list is empty, then we return total, if our list is not empty, then we do some math and jump to the beginning. Um, so the compiler can sort of take care of that, turn it into a while loop and make it go quick. Uh huh. Are lists not lazy in no, uh, nothing's lazy in Elm. Yeah. It's quite a, uh, yeah, so, so for context for everyone else, there exist languages that are in the same language family as Elm where all the values are lazy, which means they don't get evaluated until they're needed. In the context of the browser, and actually in the context of anything, that's, that has a quite a big performance overhead. Um, and generally, it's not so worth it. But in the browser, it's like a really, really costly thing to do. So instead of saying one plus two, you say evaluate this function that's gonna give me one, and evaluate this function that's gonna give me two, and then, yeah, so we don't do that. Um, so we can get a little bit crazier with uh, our, our recursive functions. So I'm gonna switch to trying to write the code over here. So yeah, this code, it's, it's just, it's going. Um, and then we'll say, here's the playground and does it work? Let's see. Nope, nope. Okay, hello, cool. So if we wanna get crazier in our recursive data structures, um, we can make binary trees. So how many folks have like made a binary tree in like Java or something like that? A decent number, okay. Recall in your mind like what that was like, right? So there was like a class, a super class of tree, and then like a loop and a node kind of thing. So we use this type. So before we saw this type message where we would say something like increment and decrement. Um, and also saw one that was like a list where it's either empty or it's cons int onto a list. 
um, we can actually make this a little bit more flexible, this list structure. So instead of saying it's a list of integers, we can say, I want it to be generic and it can hold any kind of thing. Um, so A is sort of a placeholder, it's called a type variable. So with this definition, I can say a list is cons hello, hello, <laughs> I'm gonna keep it. Uh, uh, um, and I can also make one that's um, and these each uh, will fill in the spot however they please. So if I put the type on here it would be a list of string and oops I didn't fully complete this. So this is saying empty takes no arguments, and cons takes two arguments. The first one is whatever, and the second one is a list that has the same type of stuff. So if I were to say cons hello and then cons 42, let's see what happens. Um, oh. So in this case we get I was expecting it to be a string, but in fact, it's a list of number. So it's going to enforce that it's the same kind of value all the way through. So if we want to get extra crazy, we can make a tree type where it can be empty or it can be a node with a value and then two branches. So a tree and a tree. Maybe I shouldn't do the uh, generic version first. So let's, uh, an example of this would be like, um, uh, I, I kind of want to draw. Okay, but so <laughs> I'm just going to make symbols in the air. Um, so Every tree is at least empty, and if we wanted a tree with one entry in it, we'd say, I have a node with the number 42, and it's got two uh, branches, and they can both be empty. Um, but if we wanted a node with three things, we could say, all right, I have one node with a value, and then its two children have a node with empties, a node with empties. Does that make sense? Okay. So once we have this data structure, Right, we, we, can, we can switch it to be a, the generic version. Oops. So in this world, we can have a tree of any kind of value that we want. So a question we might, might want to ask is, how, uh, uh, what's the sum of all the things in the tree? Let's do that, let's do that. Okay, so there's a trick when writing Elm code that does recursion, and it's that step one is always write the word case. That's just what you're going to do. Um, and so in this case, there's only one thing we can match on, which is a tree. And we know a tree is either empty or it's a node with a value and a left tree and a right tree. Now, if our tree is empty, what's the sum of all the nodes in the tree? Zero, okay. And if our node has stuff in it, how might we proceed? And ideally, someone who hasn't done any Elm programming before. Uh huh. Say it again. So the idea is you want to get, okay, okay. And then, yeah, that same trick I was talking about before, which is like, uh, pretend we're already done writing this function, right? So wouldn't it be convenient if we had, I don't know, a sum function that could figure out all the things going on in the tree? Yes. 
Okay, so we can say I want the sum of the left tree and the sum of the right tree. Um, and in this case, this would give us the number of elements in the tree. Um, if we give the value here, we'll actually get the sum of all the values in the tree. Um, so if I were to say my tree is node 3, node 1, empty. So writing out uh, binary trees by hand is kind of ugly, but here we are. Um, hey, we can write a helper function here. So a tree with only one thing is a node value with empty empty. And so here we can then say that instead. So we have a node and the two subtrees are just one element. Um, and so if we say what's two string sum of that tree I made, let's call it that. Great. Um, dun, 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 dun. Oh, okay. There are multiple empties now. Let's just let's just get rid of lists. That was fine. But we're on to we're on to we're on to binary trees. Who needs it? Okay. So we get nine. Um, so that that adds up. It seems to be. So. Um, Let's do another one. Um, let's say we want the depth of the tree, right? So maybe we have a root that has only right children, um, and it's got five in this direction, only one in the other direction. So Have you used Elm before? Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, what, the, if we have an empty tree, it's very, it's very shallow. Um, all right, in this case. Yeah, that went well. <laughs> yeah, so let's see if it works. I mean, is there a max function already? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, in the basics library, uh, or in, in that's sort of one of the default imports. Um, so, I mean, yeah, we can, we can check if it works. I mean, it, it works, but oh no, what? Okay. Okay. So if we make some other tree and we do, this is also a node of four and the left one is three. Okay, so what do we expect for depth with some other tree? Okay, cool. Now, what's neat about binary trees is because they branch out, they don't get very deep, right? So if we have a tree with, um, uh, wait, do I have to? Yeah, okay, so if a tree is 10 levels deep, let's say, that means the first level has one, the second level has two, those have two children, that has four, eight, et cetera, et cetera. So we can take the number, uh, essentially, if we had 10 levels of tree, we'd have two to the 10. So like, it's quite a lot of elements. And if we had 100 levels of tree, uh, I, yeah, it's a lot. Um, 
And so that means if you're doing very naive recursion, um, it's not actually going to allocate very much on the stack. So these tree structures actually make it so running out of space and needing telcal optimization is not really very necessary. So now another trick you can do is a binary tree only branches in two, but there are other data structures in Elm that branch 32, which is like, that's, yeah. So this is better, right? So if we had 10 levels of that, we're talking about, I think this is like a billion, a million? I don't know, I don't know. I need Wolfram Alpha for this. <laughs> Um, okay, but I want to I wanna show we can still u do tail call optimization on this, but it's like kind of freaky. So um, let's do some. Yeah, depth I don't know if we can do, but let's do some and let's try to do the tail call optimization trick we saw earlier. And you have to tell me, you have to tell me how it's going to go. Well, but in this, we're, we're still doing one pass, right? So the actual traversal here is... Yeah, well, so what was the first trick we did when we were doing length, right? We had that helper function. Okay, let's start there. Let's start there. So we'll get... Okay, we'll keep this one, and then we'll have our... Do you have kicks here, just for fun? I don't know. <laughs> so we have a total and we have a tree. And what's the first thing we do when we have a recursive function we're writing? Case, okay, cool. Uh, so in this case, we give the total because we're done. But if we have a node, how can we proceed? Only using some help. We need a list of uh, remaining trees to, to sum up. Oh, we could do that. That's, uh, that was more intense than I was imagining. Ah. Oh. Okay, well, I want to go a different direction. That's a very cool direction, though. Um, but so I want to start by saying some help. And then we need to fill it in. And we know that some help takes these arguments. So we have to give it some sort of integer here. And we have to give it some sort of tree here. You don't have to know the answer. Just say things, and we'll just go with it. It's gonna. It, it'll. It'll work out. I promise. What's a tree we have? That's not a trick question. There are two that we have. Left. Okay. That'll fit. <laughs> um, what's the integer we have? Val oh, wait. I heard value. Total. That's a good one. Okay. And then this is going to give us an integer, right? So let's say we did the same thing again. So forget about this for a second. What's another tree we have? Okay, cool. And then we need some sort of number here. Is there any one that might be interesting to use? <laughs> so we can just put this guy right in here. <laughs> so what's going to happen is we'll add 
this particular item to the total. Then we'll go figure out the total for the left. And then that'll be the new total. And then we'll go figure out the total for the right. So this is kind of crazy in that this function can't uh, be a tail call, right? It's a normal call. We have to call a new function, call a new function, call a new function. But when it's done, that resulting, that last sum help is a tail call. So that one can be in a while loop. So we get this very weird hybrid implementation where it'll be a while loop when we go to the right and it'll be stack frames when we go to the left. <coughs> it's just kind of weird. <laughs> um, but yeah, doing it as a list, do you want to give that a shot? I don't know. I don't know. It, it gives some thumbs up or thumbs down. Okay, I don't know how that's going to go, but we can we can try. Um, so, <sighs> so I suspect we need to keep extra information. Say it again. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's only one branch. You only need to store the, the, the max depth number of Yeah, so. Okay, so we're keeping the total and we're keeping like subtrees we still need to explore. Okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> um. And so when we call some help here, we can say the total is this value plus total. And we'll explore one tree. And we'll say the other tree goes on our sub trees we still need to explore. So this is that list thing. So we're adding it to the front of our list. So it's like saying push or array dot push in JavaScript. Um, so whenever we take a step, we'll say increment the number and then remember a subtree that we need to come back to. Um, and so that will be a while loop. Now, okay, so here we can say subtrees we still need to explore. Uh, I, I apologize, this is one is less interactive. Should I make it interactive? Okay, let's, now I'm, I, I, know, I know how to do it now, so we can make it interactive. Um, how should we proceed? But that was such a big hint, whatever. It... I'll, f I'll fill in an extra piece here. Oops. Okay, so this can be empty. I, I, I heard, I think. Okay. Right, because that means we have no more subtrees we need to look at. Lists can do other things though. So there can be a front and a back. In this case, how do we proceed? There's only like three things we can do in any given situation, right? So we know this has to start with some help if we want it to be uh, optimized. And now we need an int. What are some ints that we have? Okay. Uh, next we need subtrees we still need to explore. So back. Those are right. And then we can say front is the one we'll be looking at now. So Okay, but we couldn't have written anything else. We ran out of variables. We know we needed an integer. We knew we needed this list of stuff, and we knew we needed a tree to explore. What else are we going to do? Um, okay, let's see if it works. I'm pretty sure it works. Um, some tail call, just whatever. Oops. Oops. Wait, 
Is that what we want? 4, 8, 16. OK, cool. Hey, so this works. <laughs> OK, so what's going on here? Should we look at the code that gets generated from this? <laughs> I think, no, I think, I think it'll be good. I think it'll be good. Um, oh. I need to make that a little smaller. Okay. So what ends up happening is, again, we get our while loop. And if it's a node, oh, geez. We get the total, oh, geez, guys. And if it's not a node, <laughs> then, so essentially we see the structure of the branches here, right? So if we go side by side, oops, we have one where we're adding up. Okay, this will help to actually look at the code and then see how it looked on the other side. So in this case, we're getting value plus total. So that's value plus total. We're putting something on a list. Here we're putting something on a list. And we're saying write. And so that's write. And then in the case of empty list, we just get the total. And in the case of a list that has stuff, then we continue with some help. I don't know if we should have looked at that or not, guys. <laughs> But yeah, so that is sort of taking that, the trick of whenever you have information that you don't want to keep on the stack, you can add an argument and keep track of it that way. So either way, we have to allocate some memory. Um, but in this case, it's not going to hit the stack limit. So I think that was kind of an insane uh, thing to do. But hopefully that gave some ideas of how to use tail call optimization if it ever comes up for you. Um, so the thing is, a lot of the data structures in Elm are tree structures. So our dictionaries are actually trees that self-balance themselves. So they never, you can never make a binary tree that's all to the right. It'll get shuffled. Um, and so that means that it's quite unlikely that you'll find yourself in this situation. And with any list library functions, we have done tail call optimization in their implementations such that you don't run into these kinds of issues. Um, so hopefully that was a kind of cool uh, behind the scenes and like odd topics in Elm. Um, but yeah, so let's, let's call it with that. Um, and I don't know, are, are there any last questions? And then, uh-huh. Since the data are Mm -hmm. Like I still have all previous versions of that tree as well. Yeah. So. Okay, so is there some that up by no longer reference? Yeah. So um, we didn't do this with the trees, but let's say you do an insert. So you have a big binary tree, and you insert something deep into it. One. This isn't quite the question you asked, but um, rather than. Um, replacing the whole tree we can do is we can keep all the subtrees that stay the same and only replace a thin line. So if you say the top node is 10 and I want to insert one, well, I can say, well, I'm going to keep the right hand side, the right hand side, and I'm going to go modify the left hand side. And maybe I go to a node that's four and I say, okay, well, I'm going to keep the right hand side and modify this part. So you can actually keep a majority of the data structure when you make any particular change. Um, and because we're compiling to JavaScript, uh, JavaScript's garbage collector is just going to take care of stuff. So when no one references it, it goes away. Um, and it varies by browser how well they do with this kind of um, garbage uh, production. Um, so I don't know how much people want to know about garbage collectors in browsers, but Yeah. 
Yeah. You probably have some library you're working on. Has it ever come up or No. The browsers are quite good. I mean, this isn't the typical scenario for them, but a browsers will typically have what's called a generational garbage collector, which means there's a small chunk of memory where lots of stuff is generated, and then they go scan through that, and anything that's unused they'll throw away. And then there's older generations of stuff. Um, so they sort of keep this young generation quite small, so it's easy to scan through. And so the overhead's not crazy. Right, you'll generate into that, and then throw it all away, and then generate into it, throw it all away. So it's not a huge overhead. Um, cool. Well, uh, thanks for uh, coming out and listening to stuff about Elm. Hopefully, that was somewhat interesting and helpful. Um, if you're interested in checking out Elm more, um, there's a far more organized introduction here that sort of goes step by step through getting set up, going through how to, like, core language, which we, like, probably should have done more of, um, <laughs> right? Like, what does an if look like? I, I just went for it. Um, <laughs> like, how do you call functions? You know, we, we, figured, we figured it out. But so th this is a good place to get started. Um, and then if you're interested in looking at larger stuff, I recommend the to-do MVC application and then Richard's real world, this example. So this is about 4,000 lines that does routing. It does navigation between things, uh, between pages. Um, it's quite big, so you can find architecture patterns that you might find useful. Um, so I, I recommend checking that out. Um, but yeah, thanks for uh, coming out. And let me know if you have questions afterwards. I, yeah. Thanks.